Hey, hi everybody. My name is Jerry Wise. I'm a life and relationship coach and I am a coach for self-differentiation and I've been working with clients and folks for 40 some years. I hope you'll join my YouTube channel and click the bell to get the new videos that come out. Uh, this video today is entitled Resisting Relationship Pings. I hope that you will join me for an upcoming workshop I'm having on April 10th on Saturday. It will be on Zoom. You can sign up at my website and that's listed below. And I hope you'll take a look at my website. There's some workshops on there you can already view and, uh, and watch. This video, Resisting Relationship Pings, is about how do we deal with people pinging us and us feeling the ping. I've been working with clients recently and they've been doing great work with the uh, reducing the pinging and also learning how to respond in a more self-differentiated, calm way. First of all, I wanna say, of course there are some positive pings. You know, when I tell my child that I love them and I mean that out of my heart and I'm not doing it in a manipulative way, then I'm pinging them in a positive way. And that's certainly a good thing. I, children need to be pinged in terms of their self-esteem and love and nurturing. Uh, also, when we become adults, while it is certainly preferable and enjoyable to be loved and feel special by someone else, it's nice to hear that and be pinged by them in a positive way about the, how they feel about us. Today, I want not to, I don't want to talk about the positive pings. I want to talk about the negative pings. When we get caught, when we get stuck, when we're not sure how to respond, or we find ourselves responding in the same old ways and can't get out of that trap with relationships, family, and folks who are around us. Enmeshment pings are quite common in dysfunctional families. Uh, they, they are that over-closeness in which we just briefly act out the family dance. We briefly act out my family role. They act out their family role. And, that's, and we do that when we get pinged. They ping us, we get reactive, then we ping them, and they get reactive. And then this dance of toxic family life, this dance of pinging goes on. And actually, it's a way to maintain the status quo. Because if we just ping like we've always pinged, nothing changes. The relationship won't change. The good news is I don't have to change them. Um... I have to work on changing me and when I get panged and to use different steps in this dance I have in the relationship. All relationships have a polar push to them. Every relationship has some polar push. Um, and some relationships have much more polar push than others. Um, and the really toxic relationships or dysfunctional relationships have a great deal of pull or push in the relationship. For us to be able to resist this helps us to grow up and be stronger, be less pinged, and be able to respond in a more adult way and also make adult choices about the relationship. Because if I stay in a pinged relationship, and then I stop being pinged and I'm able to be self-differentiated. If they don't respond, then I can make choices about what kind of boundaries and what I want to do with regard to the relationship. And that's an adult choice that I have to make. I need to accept the limitations of the relationship and maybe even uh, have greater boundaries or distance in it. Um, so... Becoming more aware of being pinged 
is important. And I thought I would share some of my own. I'll just share some of my own experiences of pinging. Uh, I get pinged when I feel we're discussing a topic or issue I really don't want to discuss. I feel pinged if if a boundary is violated. Um, you know, and, and I'll give you some examples from my own family or what in a moment. But when boundaries are violated or someone's micromanaging me or someone's, then I tend to get pinged. That's a pinging area. When others are intense not calm and are reactive, that tends to be pinging, uh, a pinging that I may experience from them. Um, when someone is avoiding or ghosts me or avoids me, uh, then again, that can be a pinging that I can experience. Um, others who are angry or irritable can be a challenge for pinging. Even too much niceness or too much caretaking by them or by others can also create a ping in me that I'm going, whoa, wait a minute, red flag, red flag. And when I say pinging, I mean, I want to identify the red flags. When I say pinging, I want to be aware, oop, red flag has gone up. Um, when others want to persuade me of something, that generally is a red flag for me or a possible pinging. Uh, when others may disrespect me, that's a red flag and that's that will uh, be their attempt to ping me. They will also, others can also attempt to ping you through emotional back, uh, blackmail. Uh, you know, if you don't call your brother, our family will never be better. You know, if you don't call your mother, then she's going to feel very hurt. Well, that's emotional blackmail. And I always know that's a ping. That's someone attempting to ping me. So all of those are attempts to ping me. Now, what experience do I look for within me that tells me pinging is, is occurring? I want to react. Um, I'm not calm. Those are a couple of ways that are red flags for me that I'm feeling the ping. I feel shame or guilt when there's nothing I've done wrong. There's nothing that I have done, but yet I feel shame or guilt. And that's a, that's a red flag for a ping, that it's occurring. Um, also, if someone immaturely cuts off from me, you know, when that, friend cuts off from you and you have no idea what you did, you know, you have no clue as to what's going on, they have withdrawn from you to ping you so that you will be pinged. And that's a red flag. And we're going to learn how we can maybe manage that. When my anxiety goes up, and again, if my anxiety goes up or if I feel reactive, then I know I'm in the pinged area. Uh, if I feel fear, I am pinged. Uh, if I'm in a dynamic with a relationship in which it's either black and white or win or lose, then I know, oop, they're pinging me. Because black and white, win or lose, is often, you know, problematic. When others, when I feel, when I'm relating to others, pressured to worry or be concerned more than I want to about an issue, about a person, about an event. When I feel pressure, when I'm feeling that pressure to be more concerned or worried about it than I want to be, then I'm probably being pinged. Um, now, I realize that in relationships, uh, they can be very fluid. You know, and it's and and it's a learned process. We learn these skills slowly and learn how to use them. And what I advise people to do is to rehearse ahead of time as much as you are able. For example, if if I need to go and tell my dad that I'm switching jobs and I don't think he will like that, 
then I'm already rehearsing and preparing for that interaction with him. And I also want to rehearse or prepare my answers. What am I going to answer? And with what I think he would mostly say. And many of us are very, as I work with clients, they almost always know what the other person would say or how they would respond. So we already have that information. We want to prepare ourselves with our responses. Now, I understand that some uh, something uh, something in a relationship can happen very quickly and we haven't had a chance to prepare for it. I understand that. And we don't have to be perfect at doing this. This is not about being perfect. This is about getting better. Progress, not perfection. And so there are some times, you know, I might just get reactive. And then the better I get, the more quickly I can calm down and take and center myself rather than just stay in the emotional uh, polarization within the relationship system that just keeps pushing and pulling me which I don't want to have happen. And the first thing I usually do when I'm feeling like I want to react, want to defend, feel shame or guilt, you know, my anxiety goes up or I feel disrespected, the first thing I want to do is calm down. I want to calm down and become a 66-year-old man. A 66-year-old adult. That's how old I am, at least at the time of this video. And I want to calm down. I need to be the adult that I am. Now, if you can't be totally calm, be calmer. Work on being calmer. And that's our work, to calm down. If someone disrespects me, what do I need to do to calm down? Because I need to get serious about what's going on here. Not overly serious, but I want to get maturely serious about this, because overly serious can also be a reactivity. So, if we can calm down, even a little bit, and I've had all my clients talk about how much more helpful it is for them to just practice on staying calm, they're able to talk better, respond better, think better, uh, feel less intensity, you will be able to handle yourself better. When I have starting to feel this red flag of pinging going on, I want to push my thinking versus my feelings. I want to push my thinking versus my feelings. I also advise people to practice option C. Option A in this pinging environment that we have, it's the way I've always done it. Uh, out of my anxiety, out of my fear, out of my shame. That's the way I've always responded. And I become a victim. And so I'm loaning self to the other person. So they feel up and I feel down. I'm loaning self to them. That's A. B is I'm going to borrow self from them because I'm upset, angry, reactive, and this is the way I've always done it uh, due to reactivity. And I become the Viking rather than the victim. Well, you're just a stupid, no good son of a blah, blah, blah. Well, that's just me borrowing self from them. Because I don't need them to be that for me to be myself. I don't need them. To, and I don't need to say that. And it, what actually it does is it just keeps the status quo going. They're reacting, I'm reacting, no change. It's just another cycle of the reactivity. And then the option C is a be self response, a self differentiated response. So being a self, being the adult that I want to be with a family member, a friend, a coworker, whatever is what I, that's my goal. Let me give you an example. I was talking to someone uh, a while back and they were talking about, they had a narcissistic mother and she was very intrusive, very micromanaging, very enmeshing, uh, very easily. I mean, she could have been borderline. I don't know, but very hurt if he didn't tell her everything about his life. 
and he was planning on moving from one country to another. And his mom got all micromanagey. And by the way, he's like 40 years old. His mom gets all micromanagey about, well, what about your lease? And what are you going to do about your lease? And, you know, and just, he was just so like, wait a minute, why are we talking about my lease? I mean, I, that's, that's for me as an adult to, to deal with. Um, and, and so he was practicing because he, he would then get angry with her. And getting angry with someone doesn't necessarily change the system. It's just a different dynamic of the same system. So I want to stay calmer if someone is either intruding on my boundaries or being overly intrusive or, you know, and parents and other family members can do that. I've done that myself, you know, and so I have to watch and monitor what I'm doing. Um, and so he was, when he was angry, he was able to repractice that and repractice those skills of being able to ask mom, you know, hey, mom, um, are you, you know, are you up? He could already tell she was already exercised. She was already uh, intense about this lease thing, which he hadn't even brought up. It wasn't even an issue for him. He was just notifying her about what he was going to plan on doing. Uh, and now she got pinged, and she has her own anxiety or whatever's going on. And if you notice the anxiety in other people, then I want to counter it with calmness, not with a mirroring of the anxiety or intensity. And so he was able to practice calming down and going, Mom, are you concerned about my lease or are you upset about my lease or what I'm going to do with that? She said, well, yes. And he was able to practice. Well, Mom, I'm not upset about it. If you want to be upset, that's fine. But I'm not upset about it. And by the way, how are you and dad doing? And change the subject. That's what a, an adult would do. That's how an adult would handle that. And I realize we have a lot of family of origin stuff running around in us. So we have to practice doing that so that we can grow beyond our family dynamics and family system. I've used the example of my mother, my own mother, who was in the nursing home. Her mind was all there. She was relatively healthy, just had problems walking. And, and uh, she was in her 90s. I'm in my 60s. And she's all upset about my haircut, that it needs to be cut. And I'm going, well, and, and we were talking about so, something totally unrelated to haircut. And she just broke in my conversation and said, oh, Jerry, when are you going to get a haircut? You know, do you see your hair? It's like, what? What are we? My hair? You know, and um, and again, she's stepping over the boundaries of adulthood. I know she's a parent. Parents tend to do that. I understand that. But I could also tell she just got pinged all of a sudden, was anxious about my haircut. And what everybody would think if they would see my hair and it was long in the back, they'd just think something horrible. Well, that's... You know, I'm not sure, I, and I wasn't worried about that. So I said, well, Mom, are you worried about my hair and what other people might think? Uh, because I am not worried about that. Uh, it doesn't bother me. Obviously, it bothers you, and that's okay. If you want to be bothered, you can be bothered all you want. You can spend all your time being uh, frustrated or upset or worried or thinking what will people think or what will people think about you as a parent, which I think is partly what she was worried about, that she didn't raise me right or something. It's like, I'm 60 some years old. I'm not sure they're going to attribute that to you. I really don't. Um, and I said, you know, but, I, you know, it doesn't bother me. Now, what were we talking about, Mom? Um, I think there's also another pinging that goes on. And like I mentioned, when somebody wants me to be more concerned or worried about something that I don't want or don't feel like I'm all that worried or concerned about, um, you know, it's like, well, 
Jerry, don't you know mom has heart problems? Yes, I, I do know that. I was there as a caregiver for many years. I understand that fully. Well, I mean, I don't know what she's going to do. And I'm going, well, are, are you upset? Are you concerned about her? Are you worried about her heart problems? Because I'm not. That's not on my radar right now. Well, what do you mean you're not worried? Isn't that your mother? No, no, no. You're. It sounds like you're confusing love or concern with worry. Worrying is not going to make mom better. It's not going to change the medical condition. And it's not going to help the doctors do what they need to do, nor any other thing. It's only going to drain me of energy. And so, you know, uh, I think even my mom asked me, well, don't you worry about me? And I, and I was able to later in life be able to say, not really, mom, no. Well, I thought you cared. Oh, no, I do care. And I am concerned. But I refuse and I'm not going to worry because that won't do anything. That will only fuse us and enmesh us. I don't, and, and worry is an enmeshment state uh, and not very productive one. It doesn't mean I wouldn't help. I helped mom for many years. Um, and it, you know, if she had medical problems, I certainly was affected by that. But I'm not going to worry about that because I don't think that has any power to make anything better. And actually, in my case, uh, it was like, if you don't worry, you don't love me. No, no, I love you and I care about you. I'm just refusing to worry. That There's a difference. Um, you know, and I think there was also conversations. I have a granddaughter. She's had her own issues. She's a teenager. You know, and like, are you worried about Ayla? Aren't you worried about Ayla? What's going to happen with Ayla? And it's like, well, I, I I hope everything works out. I'm not naive, you know, and I expect there to be problems when she's a teenager. I expect that. But I don't know that me worrying about it is going to fix it. I do love her and I do care about what would happen to her. But that's not equivalent to love. Worry is not equivalent to love. Um and, and I think many families, that is the case. And in fact, I wanted to end today with thinking about these family messages and beliefs that are part of our many family of origins and a part of the family of origin super self. And one is worry equals love. Pinging equals love. If we're not pinging, we're not in a relationship. Then you're just cold and uncaring. So pinging equals love. And then reactivity equals love. Anger means you really care. Disrespecting your boundaries means I care about you if I'm disrespecting your boundaries. Or another statement, you know, um, I can talk mean to you because you are family. Because you're my son, you're my brother, you're my nephew, you're my, you know, I can talk mean to you. So see how it puts you in a favored position if I talk to you that way? I don't want to be in that favored position that way. And all of these are uh, dysfunctional beliefs that families have. And you might check and see how much worry equals love. Pinging equals love. Reactivity equals love. Anger means you care, etc., etc. I wanted to share these thoughts with you today. I hope it was a help to you. I hope you will join my workshop on April 10th, 2021. And join this Facebook, uh, join my Facebook, Instagram, and join this YouTube channel. Um, I really do appreciate all the viewers that I have and all the comments that you have made. I have a lot of great people who follow my videos, and I feel very blessed and very honored and fortunate to have that. Well, I thank you for joining me today. Have a great day, and be wise.